production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. The region's new U.S. Attorney on Crime and Criminal Justice, tonight on Behind the Headlines. I'm Eric Barnes, publisher of the Memphis Daily News. Thanks for joining us. I'm joined tonight by Michael Dunneman, new, relatively new, U.S. Attorney for Western Tennessee. Thanks for being here. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Along with Bill Drees, senior reporter with the Memphis Daily News. You were appointed in and, and voted on by the Senate in September, so, so relatively new and certainly the first time on the show, so we, we thank you for being here. Um, we'll, we'll try to go through as much as we can of your priorities and some of your background. Um, to, to start with right now, before we get into, and I know it's one of the, the, the many priorities that you've laid out, but um, still with the country in the middle of this conversation about gun violence and, and after the you know, tragic events in Parkland, Florida, what from your seat in, as a U.S. attorney in western Tennessee, what can you do about gun violence? And, and let's, let's start specifically with mass shootings or potential mass shootings? Where does that fall or does that fall within your purview? <clears throat> well, certainly it does uh, if we are able to uh, have an arrest and a, and a prosecution of the offender or anyone associated with that event who's criminally responsible. That can violate state and federal law. And we work with um, the district attorney's office, we work with the Memphis police, the Shelby County Sheriff, uh, all of the federal component agencies here in Memphis and Shelby County and across West Tennessee. Uh, and we particularly focus on, at least from the U.S. Attorney's standpoint, in the grand scheme of violent crime, we know that most violent crime is committed with firearms. And so all of these offenses that you see on school shootings, mass shootings, or involve a firearm that, that does violate federal law, whether it is a, a, a prohibited person in possession or use of a firearm. Uh, a firearm on the premises of a school or discharged in a school zone is a violation of federal law. And so uh, primarily the, the response from the U.S. Attorney's Office is we work with the FBI, we work with ATF, we work with our local law enforcement to respond to determine whether we can um, in a reactive yeah. way prosecute and hold people accountable for those actions. I will say on the on the front end of those things uh, it's often hard to prevent and predict those but uh, in the wake of this, I, I have been participating with a group uh, formed by Shelby County Mayor Mark Luttrell that includes all of those law enforcement and other community and school leaders, and we're, we're trying to put our heads together to make sure that we have a comprehensive approach to it. Once, I, I mean, I suppose in some ways it's almost an unfair question, but I'll, I'll keep asking it. Sure. But that once, once that crime has happened, once it reach, a crime reaches your office, that crime has already happened or presumably happened. But yes. do you look at it, you were a, a, a district attorney for, was it uh, Lauderdale County uh, before this? Y yes, I was actually a district attorney for five counties for in five West counties. Tennessee yeah. outside of uh, Memphis here. Um, is there, just a simple question with a lot of ramifications, are there simply too many guns out there? I think there are too many guns in the hands of prohibited or, or dangerous people. I don't think, as a general rule, there are too many guns. Uh, Law-abiding people who, who can lawfully possess and own firearms really don't create a whole lot of problem for us in the criminal justice system. It is the prohibited person, that is the minor, the juvenile, the criminal alien, the convicted felon, the person who has a background of domestic violence convictions or orders of protection, people who are engaged in possessing stolen firearms, or, uh, uh, or prohibited weapons such as short barrel shotguns or machine guns. Those are the things that we focus on in the Department of Justice of getting those out of the hands of people before they commit a crime with them. And, and before I go to Bill, just a last part, I mean, would you like to see, again, as a part of the, the criminal justice system, a person involved at the local level now, at the federal level, regional level, is there more that needs to be done in terms of laws and rules out there that would um, um, keep guns out of the hands of the, the pro prohibited people you're discussing? The short answer is yes, and I think the Attorney General and the President are working on that now. You see that on a national scale. You see that with FBI and ATF coming to the forefront, and I, I'm part of that conversation here in, in West Tennessee. Um, I, I would say also, however, um, there is a value to aggressive in investigation and prosecution and holding people accountable, hopefully preempting those crimes 
uh, by, by capturing and prosecuting people who are in possession of firearms before they pull the trigger. Okay. Bill. Yeah. Mike, since you took office last, last year, we, we have seen a lot of cases involving street gangs and involving street gangs as a, as a criminal enterprise. Is, is, is this a, a priority for, for your office in, in terms of basically suppressing these gangs? Uh, yes, it is. It's one of the top priorities of the Department of Justice and the U.S. Attorney's Office here in West Tennessee. I, I have the privilege to serve, and, and part of that service includes setting priorities for what we believe is the, is the crime uh, problem and concern here in West Tennessee and Memphis. And what we know is that uh, drug conspiracies, uh, organized crime in the form of gang activity, um, gun trafficking, human trafficking, are all done uh, by people who are coming together and agreeing and conspiring to commit those crimes together. And so it is a high priority for us to make sure that we are dismantling and disrupting that organization and we're holding them accountable from the very top leader down to the, to, to the lower people who are doing the work on the ground, so yes. And, and it, it used to be that whenever one of these announcements was made, the priority would be on, on what, what we called putting a lot of drugs on the table. Now, these charges are detailed in such a way that the emphasis is really on the structure of, the, of these organizations and the reach of these organizations as, as well. Um, yes, that's correct. And, 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 and the indictments also used to read, you might have a name of 18 people and all of them were uh, alleged members of the gangster disciples or traveling vice lords or one gang. Do you see more of a mix now of gang members uh, coming from different organizations and coming together in these y cases? Y yes, we do. In fact, what you'll see if you look closely at the indictments that we're filing is not just the racketeering and the organized crime or the gang conspiracy or the drug conspiracy and not just drug thresholds of an amount of cocaine mm -hmm. or methamphetamine or heroin. What you will see is a money la uh, laundering count. Uh, and, and so we are t targeting the financial structure of these organizations. These are businessmen. They come together from all different types of groups across gang rivalries for the purpose of making money. And they make money by selling drugs, which is poison to our children. They make money by, by dealing in stolen firearms. They make money uh, by violence. They, and, and so it's a money-making opportunity. And so one of the best ways we know to attack and dismantle these gangs, these structures, is to go after the, the, the financial incentive by money laundering and also to identify people who, are, who we can't nicely put into separate categories. They, mm -hmm. If we identify that they're, they're conspiring and coming together to commit criminal acts, then they're criminally responsible for the overall conspiracy, and we want to attack that from that angle. Is the, is the gang hierarchy a, a traditional hierarchy, is, is that in flux or, or, or is, that, is that crumbling and giving way to a new organization? I think that each time you see us take on a gang, um, we are fairly successful in disrupting and dismantling certain gangs. For instance, most recently, we, we believe that we completely took down the major stacks entertainment gang. Now that's that they called themselves that as a name, uh, ostensibly because they say they're in the music business or in the rap business. But ultimately that was something that just popped up and they created a name for themselves really for the purpose of committing crimes. We've now removed them from the streets and so whatever other organiz organization or other group of people who will come along again, they'll just rename themselves something else. They may be vice lords or gangster disciples uh, they may be Crips or whatever, but they will all come together. And, and so it is, it's almost like whack-a-mole. It, mm -hmm. they, they pop up, they create some name, they create some presence on, on the Internet or social media. They do their business. They organize in such a way that it's loose and yet effective. We take them out and another one comes along. And so we are certainly pursuing them vigorously. We believe that we've made a major dent in some of them. Um, you, you may remember uh, a few years ago, uh, Mr. Stanton took down, I believe, the fam mob uh, mm -hmm. gang. You don't, you don't hear or see much of that name anymore. You may have some of those players that move in and out of gangs, but it's very frustrating. It's very challenging for law enforcement, but we are being effective. That's why you see multiple count indictments with multiple defendants.
And you, when you say Stanton, that's your predecessor, uh, Ed Stanton, who was on the show, I believe, uh, who was uh, appointed yes. by Obama, uh, President Obama. Yes. Um, so many questions with to, to go from there. One, one, and I'm curious with your background in more of rural West Tennessee, mm -hmm. but also as as U.S. Attorney for West Tennessee, that reaches all the way. I assume there are three di three districts in Tennessee: a West, That's Middle, correct. and East. These issues of gang problems are, you know, people who live in Memphis understand that they know there are gangs in Memphis. To what degree are there gangs in rural Tennessee and drug trade and, and some of the things you're talking about? To what degree do those activities ha happen outside the cities? Uh, they are prevalent. Uh, they are they exist, uh, and we are aware of them. Uh, I was the dis district attorney in Lauderdale and Tipton County, Fayette, Hardeman, and McNary counties. Uh, and I currently now represent all 22 counties of the Western District of Tennessee, really everything in the Western Grand Division. What we know, number one, is that all of West Tennessee goes typically as Shelby County does. That is, we have a major interstate uh, coming through West Tennessee from Mexico through Texas and Arkansas into West Tennessee. That is a major trafficking pipeline from, from that area to the East Coast. Those drugs and guns and victims are trafficked through here and, and to here. What we also know is that there is a perception at least among gang members and other criminals that they may prey upon people out in the country, out in rural areas, because they don't perceive that law enforcement is capable of detecting or capturing them. And, and by pre that's so interesting. By, by prey, I mean, it's horrible, but it, it's interesting because I don't think I knew that. They yes. prey upon them in what sense? In terms of selling drugs, in terms of committing violence, in terms of... Uh, I, everything from home invasion burglaries to robberies to identity theft to, yes, of course, selling drugs and, um, and other drive-by shootings and, and, and violence of, of that type. They believe they can go out into areas where there is an easier target to, to make money, to steal money, to conspire, to sell drugs where there is, they, there is at least a perception that there is less of a law enforcement presence that might detect or capture them, and then they can come back into Shelby County or into Madison County, uh, a larger metropolitan area, and, and, and do that. So. Let's perhaps stay with, drug, with, with gangs, but mm -hmm. maybe not. Um, but on terms of drugs, right now the country and, and, and in <clears throat> Memphis and West Tennessee, the opioid, opioid crisis and we've had people local health department people on and we've had county commissioners and city council people talking on talking about suing the drug it's a huge problem i'm curious what your office is doing about that and and so maybe a, one what, what's your office doing in terms of opioids sure to what degree are drug are, are gang gangs involved with trafficking that sort of thing or to what degree is it really legal prescriptions getting in the hands of people who uh, legal drugs getting in the hands of people who use them abusively well N number one, from our office standpoint, um, the Department of Justice has made it very clear that this is a top priority. And so what we have done almost immediately since I came on board is we have appointed and assigned an opioid coordinator, an assistant United States attorney in my office that does nothing but focus on opioid uh, prosecutions and investigations. Number two, we have a district strategy in our office for investigation and prosecution of opioid-related crimes, focusing on heroin, fentanyl, uh, and the other prescription painkillers, uh, whether they're being diverted out of legitimate prescription uh, methods, whether they're being sold or stolen, or whether they are uh, as a result of people turning to hard street drugs like heroin and fentanyl. We are targeting and we're reviewing every overdose death to make sure if we can go back and investigate the source of that and hold that person accountable. We're attempting to make sure that, that we are regulating and watching uh, those Healthcare professionals that might be abusing or dishonoring their oath might be diverting those into, because all into these, the market. The, the, the legal drugs, the, the Oxycontin, mm -hmm. the um, uh, codeine, et, et cetera, those are coming from, those are legal in the United States. Now, yes. they might be being abused. So I, I am curious that you, are you, I mean, <clears throat> is the person who abuses those drugs, who gets hooked on them, is that person a criminal? And is that a priority? Or, as you maybe just implied, the priority is the people prescribing it, diverting it, or, or getting, selling it and getting it out there. I would tell you certainly that we have a comprehensive, a comprehensive approach, but, but our approach is more geared toward the supply side, not as much the demand side. The people who obtain lawful, legitimate prescriptions for pain and pain medication and take them as prescribed are not criminals. No, that's, that's fully legal. It is only when that creates an addiction and a dependence that drives people to seek out other 
street drugs or commit other crimes, that it is in fact criminal behavior. We know that that addiction then fuels people to seek out heroin, which is cheaper, it's more affordable, and more readily available. Yeah. It, and, and, and what we know is that as they chase that euphoria, as they chase that high that they're looking for in that addiction, they need stronger and stronger and more and more, and ultimately they turn to fentanyl, which can kill them. Yeah. And, and, before, and I'm sorry to cut you off. Right. Um, um, I, I am curious that um, how this compares. I would assume, as a former district attorney, you the, the meth mm -hmm. epidemic. I mean, the meth problem. How does this compare? How is it similar? How is it different to to? I mean, meth was bad enough, and still is bad. I mean, it's yes. not that that has gone away. What are the similarities and differences? In that I, way, Bill? I would tell you that uh, you have to look at this from a historical perspective. When I first started practicing law 23 years ago, uh, I can recall that, that the major street drug problem was crack cocaine. Uh, and people were hooked on crack and it was creating a lot of violent crime and, and a lot of addiction and heartache. And, and we, we really fought back with that on state law, met some mandatory minimums on, under federal law and really got, got serious about tackling the crack epidemic. We still have crack cocaine today. People are still addicted to it and it's still trafficked. Uh, in the mid-2000s, we did uh, undergo the, the methamphetamine epidemic where not only were people uh, addicted to it, they were actually able to manufacture it themselves. They were making it in bathtubs and barns and hotel rooms and, and bathrooms and they were uh, converting dangerous chemicals into methamphetamine that, w that was a fire hazard and a, an explosive hazard. And so it wasn't just the addiction it was the manufacturing component of that. Uh, and, and what we did under state law, as you remember, we, we kind of um, regulated pseudoephedrine, the, the precursor ingredient to make methamphetamine in such a way that people weren't able to make it anymore themselves. They're not blowing themselves up anymore, but they're still addicted to methamphetamine. Now it's just being trafficked, manufactured from China or Mexico and trafficked into West Tennessee in a purer form, a more dangerous form. And, and gangs and drug dealers are making a whole lot of money on it. Now we, the, the new animal on the block, the new problem obviously, obviously is opiates uh, and, and the prescription drugs are creating an addiction that drives people to heroin and fentanyl and it's more deadly than any of the other things I've just talked about. Yeah, so. we'll go to Bill. In, in the last week, U.S. Attorney General Jeff Sessions has, has talked about going or, or, or looking at the big pharmaceutical companies to see if there is any kind of legal culpability there. And, and, and I think that's kind of a good way to get into this whole question of when we see something on the news or report on something in the news about a discussion in Washington among the president and the U.S. Attorney General, um, those are not your marching orders. Your marching orders come in a more formal way as part of a discussion process in, in the beginning. So when the U.S. Attorney General says we need to start looking at pharmaceutical companies, um, that statement in and of itself is not where your office begins. It's more detailed than that. That's correct. Uh, th those decisions, those policy decisions and legal decisions are made at the, at the highest levels of the Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. Those decisions about litigation against drug companies uh, are certainly legitimate uh, and, and we support them. We support that that's one way to tackle this problem. But here on the ground in West Tennessee, we, we are not focused on filing those lawsuits and litigating in, in, in our courts here in West Tennessee. We're really focused on, again, the supply side of the traffickers, the people who are creating the overdoses and the overdose deaths, the people who are making money on that. And, and we are uh, very aggressively uh, focused on those cases in such a way that we have ramped up our caseloads and, and there are people who will be going to federal penitentiary for that. So our litigation is not necessarily civil uh, litigation against drug companies. It is criminal litigation against criminals who are making money and killing people in this district. What, what is your office's operating priority now in terms of enforcing immigration laws, which is, as you know, there's been so much discussion about? Well, I will say uh, we do have a renewed uh, commitment to criminal immigration enforcement. And I, and I want to make this very clear because there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding about this uh, in the public. Number one, it is against federal law. It is a crime to be in this country illegally without a proper permit or visa. Let's make that clear. Um, however, the Department of Homeland Security and Immigrations and Customs, they have an administrative removal procedure. That is, if you're found to be in this country uh, without permission, without a, a valid uh, permit or visa, 
uh, you can be administratively removed. My office does not engage in that litigation or that action. That's actually a separate court, a separate administrative agency, and that's all handled by uh, the Department of Homeland Security and uh, Immigrations and Customs. What we are focused on here in the U.S. Attorney's Office, however, is what we refer to as a criminal alien. And, and I think words are important here, Bill. Immigrants are people who have come here legally or are in the process of obtaining legal status properly. Aliens are people who are here illegally. So I prefer to call them criminal aliens because that's what they are under the law. Those people who come here without permission, they're not here legally, and then commit additional crimes that violate federal law. Those are the ones we're focused on, the criminal aliens who are in possession of firearms, who are trafficking firearms, who are selling drugs, those criminal aliens who are um, engaged in identity theft, document fraud in order to, to uh, obtain work or to uh, compromise uh, some type of security or to steal identities, and then aggravated reentry aggravated re into this country. What we see over and over again is the administrative removal process will work, will remove and deport people, and they will come right back here into this country. We will be able to document and find that they have illegally reentered. That's a crime. About five minutes left. Sure. With, staying with immigration for a second. I mean, so is there a distinction in your office between the person who comes and commits one of the crimes that you just talked about, the criminal alien, and, as you call them, and the person who comes here without a visa, comes here illegally, and is in school? is in college, has a job. Is that a person that's on your priority list or on your radar that, to be removed? They're here illegally, but they are participating, they're <clears throat> ostensibly paying taxes and they're simply living their lives. I would say that that's a person that does not come on my radar, but radar because I don't know about them unless Immigrations and Customs brings them to me for a, ch a criminal charging decision. I would say that we, one of the priorities of the Department of Justice is making sure that we are enforcing the rule of law and we enforce it even handedly and without regard to person. And so I would say that if that person is here and, and yet they're still going to school and they believe they're being productive, they're still in violation of the law and there is a consequence for that, either administratively or criminally. I, I would tell you the ones that come to my attention, the ones that are brought to me for criminal investigation and prosecution are those who are here illegally, who have come back illegally and are continuing to commit crimes that endanger our people and our society here in West Tennessee. We'll switch gears with just a few minutes left and we could do a whole show just on this question. And sure. we've done other shows and we'll have you back hopefully and talk more about all of these issues and things we won't get to. Um, the, you talked about the crack cocaine. I think it was you said that you, know, you put man, man, mandatory minimums were put in place yes. and that was part of solving that problem or, or at least mitigating that problem. Where are you on questions of criminal justice reform? We've had people on the show. We've talked about a lot on a local level and a state level now on a federal level. You know, there are people, and there's nationally, people in very conservative states, <clears throat> Texas, for instance, Oklahoma, states that are looking and saying, look, these idea of mandatory minimum, this idea that we're going to just lock everybody up as the solution to all levels of crime um, are beginning to question that. So taking out for a second the person who's the head of a gang who, who's killed someone, the, the, the ultra-violent conspiratorial people, but maybe let's say the person who is working on a street corner in a gang and is, quote, only maybe passing along a small amount of drugs or is swept up somehow by their choice, by a bad decision, but a low-level offense, what is your take on that? And should, is jail, prison the right answer for those low-level offenses? There is and ought to be a consequence for all criminal behavior. That is the rule of law in this country. And I'm a firm believer that if we say we're going to enforce the law and we don't, that we are encouraging and emboldening more criminal behavior. That's what's been wrong with the state law that I practiced for many, many years and prosecuted under is that we did not have mandatory minimums. We did, did, did not have truth in sentencing under our state law. We said that if you broke into someone's home and committed an aggravated burglary, you got three years in prison, but that was not the case. What it really meant is that you got three years at 30% with probation. That's not justice. And that's not doing what we say we're going to do. Under federal law, there is no parole. You serve 100% of your sentence. And in certain circumstances, there are mandatory minimums. And I guess I would say to you, Eric, is that those consequences are there. If people want to make choices to commit crimes, then we will enforce them. And we will enforce them unapologetically. There are some people who are so dangerous that they do not need to be walking among us. 
There are some people who need to be stopped in their criminal behavior because they continue to repeat, offend, and recidivate over and over and over again. And I believe the reason that they do is because we didn't do what we said we would do in the first place. So in that sense, you think that the federal guy, the 100 percent, you know, you're going to serve the full amount that you're sentenced to. Is that effective? Do yes. those people not, th there's not as much recidivism, people going back into jail who come out of those 100 percent sentences? I would tell you that it accomplishes the goals of criminal prosecution and public safety. And that is to incapacitate dangerous offenders, to hold people accountable for the rule of law and violation of it. It is specifically and generally a deterrent to that individual who is in prison and to other people in the public that can be seen uh, that we mean what we say. It accomplishes vic uh, justice for victims. You know, I, uh, often we forget about the victims of crime who also deserve justice and it enforces the rule of law. So I do believe that it's a very effective tool uh, and making sure that we're keeping our communities safe by putting people in penitentiaries. All right, we will leave it there. Thank you for being here. We'll have you here again and talk about more. Thank you, Bill, and thank you for joining us. Join us again next week. <laughs>